Hello, glad that you are on board to experience a little bit of history. Over 68 years ago, I participated in what you are about to see and hear. This virtual tour features a mission on operations off of two straight deck carriers when I was aboard back in the early 1950s. The ships were the USS Philippine Sea in 1953 during Korea and the USS Hornet in 1954 following the war. A series of slides and videos will point out the differences between a straight deck and an angle deck carrier. Before we go on the tour, there is a short bio of me and an explanation why I am a docent on the Hornet. I was born and raised in the Bay Area. After leaving the service, I was in education for 33 years in Castor Valley as a teacher, coach, and administrator. I have been a docent since 1998 for over 23 years. The primary reason for being a docent is to bring history to visitors. It is amazing that a number of visitors know little about what happened in the 20th century. Many do not know history regarding World War II, Korea, and even Vietnam. And now they don't even know some prominent individuals such as Roosevelt, Truman, Eisenhower, MacArthur, Churchill, and Stalin. Now on to the tour. The Hornet is the fourth of 24 Essex class carriers built, 14 of which were in World War II. They were the largest carriers at that time and not one was sunk. The Hornet has been modified several times. The largest modification was in 1956 from a straight deck to an angled deck carrier. All carriers have a similar construction. When you come on board, the first deck or the main deck is commonly called the hangar deck. It is the middle diagram. As you go below, the decks will be numbered two through seven as indicated in the bottom diagram. As you go up from the hangar deck, you are now on levels. Going up three levels, you will be on the flight deck, the O3 level. The O stands for the word overhead. There are 10 levels. And so with seven decks and 10 levels, the ship is 17 stories high. Pictured is a typical Essex class carrier. Using the information covered in the preceding slide, look at the flight deck. It's the O3 level. The top of the island or superstructure is the O10 level. Where you see the water, the water line is approximately even with the fourth deck below. The draft, meaning how far down is the hull, the draft with the full load is 34 feet. Size-wise, the length of an Essex-class carrier is approximately 882 feet, almost three football fields. Compare that to a nuclear carrier today at 1,100 feet. The displacement weight at commissioning was 27,000 tons. It is now 40,000 tons after the 1956 modification. Compare that to nuclear carriers at 105,000 tons. The number of personnel on an Essex class carrier was around 3,000. The nuclear carriers has between five and 6,000. This slide compares a straight deck to an angle deck carrier. 
The left photo shows a straight deck. Pictured is the USS Oriskany CVA-34, sister ship of the Hornet. Note a plane landing and plane stored way up forward. What happens if a plane's tail hook fails to encounter the resting wire and bounces over the barrier or the barrier breaks? There will be a horrific accident resulting in death. Now the right photo is an angle deck carrier. The bow or the forward part of the ship is well to the right of the landing area. Notice no planes in front of the runway and a plane can continue around and come in for another try if the tail hook does not encounter the wire. It's much safer than a straight deck. Here is the USS Philippine Sea CVA-47, my home for seven months during the Korean War. The Phil C was not in World War II as construction began in August of 44, and it wasn't commissioned until May of 46, well after World War II. The Phil C made three tours in Korea, earning nine battle stars, and get this, it was decommissioned on my wedding date, December 28th, 1958. One of my favorite planes, the Grumman F9F Panther jet, probably the best Navy jet in early 1950s. Notables who flew this type of plane during the Korean War included Neil Armstrong, the first man on the moon, Ted Williams, baseball Hall of Fame player for the Boston Red Sox, and John Glenn, our first man in space. It was the first jet plane for the Navy's demonstration team, the Blue Angels. The Panther the jet was featured in the 1954 movie, Bridges of Toko Re, starring William Holden, Grace Kelly, Mickey Rooney, and Frederick March. Here you see a pilot's ready room. Essex class carrier had four ready rooms. Each one was assigned to a certain squadron in the air group, and I was in air group nine. CAG nine was made up of VF-91, my squadron, VF-93, VF-94, and VA-95. Each of the ready rooms had 20 to 24 seats for pilot briefings or meetings. Now, each wartime mission differs from other conflicts. In Korea, Navy aircraft rarely encountered an enemy plane. Navy pilots' primary function was supporting the troops. Now, there are eight types of missions that we were responsible for during Korea. Reading from the top, going down, the strikes where you had a designated target. The arm reco, you were going along railroad tracks or highways or roads looking for targets of opportunity. Close air support, you were attacking enemy troops just beyond the front lines. Cherokee close air support, you were attacking enemy supplies just beyond their troops. The Cherokee was named in reference to the Admiral at that time, Admiral Jocko Clark, who was a Cherokee Indian. Photo escorts, we were protecting the unarmed photo planes. CAP, Combat Air Patrol, you weren't over enemy territory, but you were protecting the trash force out about 100 miles over the sea. Tar cap, you were over enemy territory. You were protecting the planes that were on a target. And then the MPQ, a radar controlled uh, where you were directed to a certain target. 
Here I'm going to be using the cursor and the left photo has a, as soon as I bring the, here is Japan. Directly to the west is Korea, North Korea and South Korea. You have to remember this, that Korea for years was governed by Japan. Okay. Here you come down is Taiwan. But when I was flying back in the 50s, it was called Formosa. It is now called Taiwan. South of China here is a big island. This happens to be uh, Hainan Island, which I will be talking about later. And then for those that flew in Vietnam, here's Vietnam. Other references. Here happens to be the Philippine Islands. And then the uh, city of oh, Hong Kong was in here. We are going to this chart, a coordinate chart now. The vertical and horizontal lines. Here's a vertical line. Here is a horizontal line. They are not latitudes and long longitudes, but simply reference lines within a sector. Now, let's go back. This whole sector right here, there were 10 vertical and 10 horizontal lines. Somewhere on a target photo, this little point right here, I have marked off. Supposing on a photo, this was the target area. Okay, how do we find that particular target off a photo. What you do is you go along these vertical lines right here. And there is between four and five. Don't think of this as four. Think of it as 400. Okay, now, this photo actually says six digit number. 450625. I'm going to take these six digits and I'm going to read from left to right and then vertically. I take the first three digits, 450, 450 is approximately halfway. So right there, you run a, an imaginary vertical line. Let's go back to the coordinates. 625. Okay, here is 600. 625 would be approximately a quarter of the way between 600 and 700. So now you draw a horizontal line. And where those two lines, two imaginary lines, that is going to be your target. So remember, you're going to be using three digits and then three digits and where they intersect will be the target. Okay, we're going to this particular thing and I'm going to once again use the cursor. First of all, the air intelligence officer will come in and give us a, a picture of where we're going to be going. And so this is a, an actual target photo of a mission. I don't know if I was ever on that. But somewhere on this photo, there will be, there's right there, CU. You can barely see it, CU. And then a six digit number, 645. Five four three. Remember that. See you six four five five four three. Okay, now this is a picture taken out of my chart book. We had twenty two pages on it, and I was over on this one. I was saying, see you. The old phonetic alphabet was Charlie Uncle. Well, here's the U. You see it out there on that page? C would have been over on this left-hand page. Okay, 
I'm going to use those same numbers that I have right here, six, four, five. So here's the six. I'm going to go six, four, five, approximately halfway. I'm going to put an imaginary line, vertical line. And then I'm going to use the last three digits, five, four, three. Here's five, five, four, three, again, almost halfway. I'm going to put a horizontal line. Okay, now, where they intersect, it's going to be right there. You can barely see it. There's an indentation. That indentation happens to be this half moon bay right here. Okay, so what we will do is we're using the chart to see where the, the target photo is. And then when we fly, we will fly in from way out here in the east. And once we represent or see these islands and recognize them, we fold that up. And this target photo is on our knee pad. Okay, what we're going to do is walk around the flight deck. Let me say that is the island of the present Hornet. This is on an angle deck carrier. I'm going to talk, talk a little bit about it. There you have the F-8 Crusader supersonic plane. And then we have the F-14 Tomcat. Looking back at San Francisco, so you, when you come aboard, you're going to get a great, great view of the bay. This is the type of helicopter that recovered Apollo 11 and Apollo 12. Notice that that helicopter is on that yellow line right there. That yellow line really is the center line for our landing area. You see, it's coming off at an angle. That's why it's an angle deck carrier. Those cranes over there are on the ships that belong to the ready reserve of the merchant marine. They are not Navy ships. They're fielded with civilian sailors. Now we're looking at the bow of the ship way up forward. There's two planes up there on our catapults that you can't see. Uh, you don't see the catapults, but believe me, they were there. And we are back to the island, and we will be talking about that a little bit later. Okay, the flight deck crew. The left photo shows a straight, straight deck configuration. You will see the men that are on there. This is actually set up almost to recover aircraft. Not quite because there happen to be a few planes there just opposite the island. But all of those men that are on that flight deck will have different colored jerseys. And here they are, the yellow, directs the movement of the aircraft, the white are the officers and other who, who are in charge, the green shirts handling the catapults, the purple shirts, the fuel planes, the brown shirts are the plane captains. You'll see a plane captain a little bit later on. Uh, the blue shirts are the guys who are doing the heavy work, pushing the planes in a position, driving the tractors. The red shirts, they're in charge of the loading, the ammunition, and you don't see the silver shirts too much uh, handling aircraft cra crashes and fires. We don't want any of those. Okay, we're going to see a little video here. And it's not taken off the Hornet, but it shows uh, some catapult shots. One, yeah.
before we change to the next thing, I just wondered if you noticed when the pilot was ready to go, he gave a thumbs up. And then finally, what he did, he saluted the catapult officer. And once you salute, you hang on for dear life because in approximately two minutes, you are traveling over 110 miles an hour. And I'll say this, I hated every cat shop. Okay, in flight, the left photo shows me sitting in the cockpit. I don't, I'm not strapped in because what happens is that if there is a somewhat of a threat that someone at a distance may be attacking, they will have planes uh, manned, you're in condition too. And this is ready to go shortly. So you're relaxing there, but you will harness up very quickly. If it, there's really a danger, you would be in condition one and your harness straps would be secured, ready to go as soon as possible. The selfie taken at the right shows you that uncomfortable oxygen mask Oxygen masks were required above 15,000 feet and at nighttime above 10,000 feet. Now you're going to see a homemade video. Sit back and relax. This video was originally taken with 8 millimeter movie camera film and transferred onto VCR tape in 1986. Different aspects of carrier aviation are depicted in this video. Scenes of the carrier replenishing, catapult and deck takeoffs, formation flying, carrier landings, the landing signal officer, and finally coming home to the Bay Area in 1954. The planes featured are the F9F Panthers and Cougars, the AD Sky Raider, and the F4U Corsair. There are many ships that comprise a task force, three to four carriers, several battleships and or cruisers, and many destroyers. On replenishment day, other auxiliary ships join the task force. In the background, you see a carrier. There's also a battleship with a carrier well in the background. These scenes were taken on the USS Philippine Sea, CVA-47. Here, the Phil C is replenishing the destroyer, the USS Buck, DD-761. The carrier band would entertain ships alongside during replenishment. Notice how close the ships are to each other. Sometimes just 35 to 40 feet separate the ships. The oiler USS Guadalupe AO32 is transferring personnel over to the carrier. At the same time, she is refueling the Phil C. You will notice on her starboard side, there is a destroyer also refueling. Before any air operations, a helicopter takes off and is on station to pick up pilots that might have to ditch. Pilots are manning their planes. During winter, when the sea temperature was below 60 degrees, pilots wore exposure suits to prevent hypothermia in case of having to bail out or ditch in the water. The plane captain is assisting me while getting into the cockpit. He hands me the maps, the target photos, and helps adjust the shoulder straps. On these two planes taxing out, observe these bombs underneath the wings. These planes are F-9F Panthers, the Navy's premier carrier jet during the Korean War. The Panthers are catapulted off the Phil Sea. 
Notice the 47 painted up forward on the flight deck. These scenes are taken off the Hornet. This gentleman is called the catapult officer. You will notice how his shirt is blowing in the wind. We needed about 35 knots of wind across the deck. Notice how quickly planes could be catapulted off. This is an interesting one. Watch 304 there on the port cat. He will get a sort of a weak shot. He goes down below the carrier and the cat officer looks at him. He takes a look. He comes back this way and then takes a double look to see if that plane had gone into the water. This is an F9F6 Cougar jet. The Cougar jet was a swept wing version of the Panther. It's very comparable to the U.S. Air Force's F-86 Sabre jet. Notice the 12 on the bow of the uh, deck, carrier deck. This is the Hornet. These are Cougars once again, the swept wing version of the Panther. We're going to have an interesting scene uh, very shortly. The number one elevator, which is that rectangle right below the 12. It will be down while one of the Panther jets is being catapulted off. Whether this was a mistake, I'm not sure. I don't think that was standing standard operating procedure. There it is. The elevator is down. The wheels were very close to that elevator. These planes are the AD Sky Raider, an outstanding attack plane used during Korea and Vietnam. These planes carried a heavier bomb load than most of the big bombers in World War II. Prop planes usually deck launch, but could be catapulted if necessary. This AD must have something wrong as it is being lowered to the hangar deck by the number two elevator. Note that the propeller is still rotating. This is the F4U Corsair used in World War II in Korea. Same type of plane featured in the TV series Baba Black Sheep, the Marine Fighter Squadron during World War II. A flight of Panther jets, a fighter squadron VF-91, fly over Hawaii a few days before going to Korea. The Panther was featured in the movie Bridges at Toko Ri. This is called an echelon formation. Notice how close the planes are to each other with overlapping wingtips. It was difficult flying left-handed while shooting the film with the right hand over the left shoulder. Occasionally, you might see the reflection of my hand on the stick reflecting off of the canopy. There's the reflection of the hand. You can really see the stick right there. Down below, you will see some of the ships in Task Force 77. Sometimes they say the carrier looks like a postage stamps. It looked like a half a postage stamps. We're going to have carrier landings. There were 12 resting wires and three barriers on the Essex class carriers. That plane came a little bit too high and too fast. And notice how far up the deck it rolled. Pilots would try to catch the number two or number three wire. It was best if the pilot touched down near the center line. You will see several good landings and several not so good. This was a good one. Notice where he stopped. Sometimes these planes would only travel about 100 feet and they would come to a complete stop. The next shot will be of a plane that comes in too high and too fast. And notice where he rolls. He possibly catches about the number six wire. He's on top of the number three elevator at that particular time. I try to approach around 122 knots, which works out to approximately being 140 miles per hour. 
the prop planes came in about 30 to 35 knots slower than the jets. This is the Corsair. Watch where it touches down. This is a lousy landing. It's almost in the port catwalk. So happens he was my closest friend aboard the carrier. Watch the plane coming in. Here we have a wave off. The deck was not clear, so the pilot had to go around and try again. We will see the landing signal officer waving off a few planes in a moment. This is a Panther jet was a photo plane. These shots were taken down on the LSO platform. The landing signal officer stands on a platform aft on the port side. There normally would be two or three LSOs and several enlisted personnel in that area. Each approach and landing is graded. The LSO, LSO signals pilots using two paddles. Watch the two men in the lower right-hand corner. They will duck down as the plane touches down. The reason? If the wire broke, there was a chance that they could be decapitated. So, of course, they're coming in. We don't see the touchdown. Finally, upon conclusions of the air ops, the Angel lands back on board. On this particular slide, it shows what uh, CAG-9, Carrier Air Group 9 did during the seven months we were out there from January 30th through July 27th. And uh, nothing to be really proud of. Uh, we, remember, we were trying to support the troops on the grounds. Uh, one thing that might be of interest, if you look over right about the middle of the slide, that thing, the very first thing says ox carts. Why would you take out ox carts? Well, in Korea, one of their primary modes of transportation of ammunition was by ox carts. And as a pilot, we had real problems. Do we want to take out that ox cart or not? Because it could be a very innocent North Korean citizen. Whereas uh, if you did take it out and it blew up, you were pleased because you, you got rid of somebody who was going to try to shoot you down. What happened uh, after uh, Korea? We flew to Norfolk, uh, to board the Hornet, and we were on a round-the-world goodwill cruise. The ports of call included Lisbon, Naples, Suez Canal, Colombo Salon, Singapore, Manila, Hong Kong, Pearl Harbor. During the cruise, the ship crossed the equator on June 24, 1954. The primary reason for the tour was to show our strength at sea, a goodwill message and to help patrol the waters between Formosa, which is now called Taiwan and China. The picture that you see right there was in ready room one just below the flight deck. This was a squadron meeting for all pilots in our particular squadron. Note the flight suits hanging on the hooks. The skipper is sitting right in the front. Now, since this was peacetime, our missions would be combat air patrols. However, little did we know that there would be one different type of mission, a search and rescue. In July 1954, a British airliner was shot down by two communist planes off of Hainan Island, a very large island southeast of southern China. The two carriers on station at that time happened to be the Phil C and our own Hornet. Pilots from these two carriers were sent out to look for survivors on a search and rescue mission. Two days later, pilots from the Phil C shot down two 
Chinese planes. Was this incident going to be the start of World War III? Life magazine came on board a short time later to interview the pilots. The Admiral was stationed on the Hornet, so the meeting took place on the Hornet. A photographer roamed the ship and passed by Ready Room 1, our Ready Room. Our flight was going out on a cap mission and we were photographed. Guess what? The Hornet got the publicity and the filthy pilots were really upset because they didn't get anything. It so happens that the person right in the front is me, my one claim to fame. The plane on the right is the F9F6 Cougar. This is what I was flying at that particular time off the Hornet. This picture was taken from the mural painted on the hangar deck. The mural was painted by a docent and shows every type of plane on the two Hornets on CV-8 and CV-12. Here you have four Cougars. If you look carefully, you'll see the tail hooks hanging down. They're coming home to land. We would try to have an interval of 20 seconds, no more than 30 seconds. We would pass by the starboard side in an echelon, then break left and fly a racetrack pattern leading back to the ship. At the 180 position, we would call to the ship indicating gear down, hook down, fuel state, and start to turn into the groove. Guess what? One of our characters, as Lieutenant JG, called in at the 180 one time and added a little more information by stating, hey, my radio is out, and if you read me, rock the ship. There was complete silence on the air. Ah, coming home, arriving home in Alameda. Here we are docked at Pier 3 on December 10th, 1954. This same picture is in the wardroom currently on our ship. And with that ends our mission. And I encourage you to come visit the ship at Pier 3 to see a great museum. Thanks for attending. Okay.